At the schoolboy level, Jamaica has two of the most highly organized football competitions in the world, the Manning Cup and the Costa Cup. Despite the longevity and success of these two competitions, there are some issues which must be given prompt attention and corrective action taken in order to bolster the character of these competitions. I will mention a few. The organizers of these competitions need to be far more meticulous in devising the fixtures to ensure that our teenagers are not required to play a number of matches within a few days. Next. Some members of the coaching staff and the administration of different schools, by their over-enthusiasm and desire to be competitive and win at all costs, are contributing to some of our young footballers developing serious injuries without them being able to afford the proper medical care. Of course, this is not unique to footballers, as students of other sports are also plagued with the same malady and a number of playing services being used by our youngsters to train and play matches should not be used. Having reached our zenith in football in 1998, the principal question to be asked is, why has Jamaica since then not been able to sustain that level of competence and achievement? I can see that there are no easy answers, but I would wish to pose a few questions while making a few points. Where is the development or national plan to move the best of the players from the secondary school level to the national level? Indeed, to move our players from the junior level to the national level. The players who have been selected for the Alder Costa and All Manning teams each year and the best of those who play in the Olivia Shield competition are supposed to be the best players during these competitions for an year. What happens to them thereafter? Why is there no program to keep them together for, say, three years, four years, five years? What of community-based football development? In sports, in conjunction with the SDC, the parish associations, and the Jamaica Football Federation, should formulate a national community football plan with the aim of developing football at the community level. At the moment, the states made up of InSports, SDC, SDF, and the privately sponsored parish associations appear not to be in sync in their approach to developing football at the community level. Coordination in this area must be improved. And finally, much more effort is required to develop a country's football program from a business perspective. Over the last few years, Jamaica has been able to have players recruited by overseas clubs. <clears throat> the income generated from this is invaluable for the growth of the clubs in question and for the communities from which these players are drawn. However, we need to organize and structure our national football in such a manner that we are able to produce players specifically for the overseas market. The impact of this financial injection on the clubs and the communities from which these players are drawn would immediately enhance their development and have an economic multiplier effect. I now turn to a topic which I'm absolutely sure keeps up, keeps up, keep us up some nights. Jamaica and the West Indies cricket. Jamaica has garnered international cricketing glory by producing some of the finest cricketers in the world and by be, being part of a once mighty West Indies team which dominated international cricket between 1975 and 1995. Since then, West Indies cricket and by extension regional domestic cricket has been on a downward spiral, getting from bad to worse. And I won't say what a gentleman told me yesterday, um, getting from bad to worse. He used an expression which I hear from time to time, or worse or <laughs> something like that. The last few years have been dominated by constant demands for increased financial packages by the players, despite their declining performances, lack of application, and sometimes wayward behavioral tendencies which make a mockery of the sport. 
The constant demand for increased pay packages has led to frequent clashes between the West Indies Cricket Board, WICB, which has the responsibility for the administration of West Indies Cricket, and the Players' Bargaining Unit, the West Indies Players' Association, or WIPO. Make us weep sometimes. <laughs> In an effort to improve the structure and administration of West Indies Cricket, and by extension the team's performance, the WICB established a committee Headed, which was headed by former Prime Minister P.J. Patterson to make the necessary recommendations. The report by the committee was submitted in October 2007. The committee made the following, among others, observations and recommendations, and I quote, the base of West Indies cricket management must be broadened and the quality intensified. As a project, it should be placed in the hands of two regional bodies, a general council made up of the stakeholders of the game, and an executive board to answer to the general council, end of quote. This has not happened. In fact, the board, at its meeting in February 2008, totally rejected this recommendation. Why? Because what the partisan-led committee is asking the WICB to do is to preside over its own liquidation. It will not happen. In the meantime, West Indies cricket, despite the 4-1, which we gave Zimbabwe, <laughs> continues to sink much to the agony of all West Indies cricket fans. And every time we win a simple match, we hear that we are turning the corner. The corner is very long. In fact, noted cricket writer Tony Becker has argued that things are so bad that the West Indies players could be considered successful if generally the bowling averages of their bowlers were the batting averages of their batsmen and if the batting averages of their batsmen were the bowling averages of their bowlers. Possibly the only exception might be Chandra Paul and Gay. The board's ineptitude in the management of West Indies cricket has been matched stride for stride by the arrogance and self-serving tendencies of WIPO in its nauseating and intransigent contract dispute with the WICB. Against the background of what I have outlined, I wish to make the following recommendation. One, the governments of the region, acting through CARICOM, must do all in their power to influence the change in the structure of the WICB, as is recommended in the report of 2007. Two, that a scheme be developed whereby West Indian cricketers are paid on the basis of their performance. We're not short of expertise in the Caribbean. imagine if they were batting or bowling for grace over the years. We're not short of expertise in the Caribbean to develop a performance-based scheme. We can do it. Third, that no player be scheduled to play for the West Indies unless he has signed a contract clearly stipulating that to which he's entitled. Next, part of the reorganization of West Indies cricket requires that more emphasis be placed on the business component of its operations. It needs to place more immediate and greater focus on marketing its television rights. At the moment, the WICB is earning little or nothing at all from these rights. 2020 cricket, for those who follow it and watch IPL cricket all night. The 50 overs cricket before it has far more cash incentives than test cricket. The WICB needs to impress upon the ICC the importance of organizing its schedule in such a manner that these international cricket competitions do not affect the touring schedule of test playing nations. Six, there's the need for the establishment or re-establishment of a cricket academy in the region with special emphasis on addressing the mental attitude and aptitude of the players. And next, more emphasis must be placed on the development and growth of domestic cricket in the region. In this context, I would like to make some observations about Jamaica's domestic cricket, as the nature of West Indies cricket is determined by what is happening at the domestic level. Currently, here in Jamaica, there's a lack of a national strategic plan which identifies from very early young, gifted players, and thereafter facilitates their transition from basic players to good quality players. Jamaican cricketers who made it to the West Indies teams were primarily products of the clubs. Now most clubs are struggling to survive. 
much more emphasis has to be placed on club cricket. 